Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I am truly excited to be here today and to be talking about tests. And I believe so far we've had great sessions from morning. And I truly appreciated your session because it made me think about my design for, I started, a uh, I started a podcast and it made me think about my design and being consistent because I think I've been using any font I get out there. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I don't, I'm not a designer, but. We can talk. <laughs> yeah, we can talk. So I, I really did appreciate that. So my talk today is, is gonna be about testing. I don't claim to be an expert in testing, but I do enjoy testing. And uh, I think many companies do appreciate testing. We do have companies that don't actually do testing. And uh, either way, I think testing is one of the best things you can do for your applications. And today, we'll just roughly walk, talk about what is UI testing and what is Android UI test automation. Of course, we cannot talk about tests if we don't have any flakiness, so we'll touch a little bit on that and then I'll show you resources on where you can read more because I feel like that's a very in-depth topic by itself. And then I'll talk about a UA Automate APIs, why actually my talk is about automation. We'll look into that. And then I'll talk about popular Android UI testing tools that are out there that you can utilize and use. Just touched roughly, go through the advantages. And then um, you cannot talk about UI testing without mentioning a little bit of unit tests because I feel like all of it, it it's tied together, especially if you're an Android engineer or actually work in even web or even iOS, I believe you have to do UI and also unit tests. I do know many companies though prefer doing unit tests, but for the companies that have worked for previously, both of them, we've done both UI and unit tests. And then we'll talk about a CSCD tools, just roughly touch through them and then a conclusion. So that is the agenda for today. Hopefully I won't go over time because I know we're running late. But first, I'll introduce myself. That's me. I am work as a senior Android engineer. I'm also a GDE Android. I recently um, got a deal to write a book about Android. So I've been doing Android from 2014. And uh, from that time, I've learned a lot on how Android has Actually, one thing that I do appreciate is see now Android has grown and has really become easier for developers now. Uh, it, it really, so even just to not finish that thought, but to, I just wanna mention this. I am not a fan of writing technical stuff. That, is, that was my biggest weakness. So when I got this particular deal, I was like, wait, I've always wanted to write books, like science fiction books. So I thought, wow, this is actually a good way to get into, see now can I can write a book. So I decided to accept it and I'm actually in chapter eight, so I'm going pretty well, I'm almost done. And uh, I'm also a Women Take Makers ambassador and I'm a mom, so I do live in New York and my kids decided they wanted to see Canada, so they said, mama, we're not staying home, so we have to go with you and see what you do. So I brought them with me. At least they can learn some testing too. <laughs> and then uh, that's about me. And with that, uh, let's talk about testing. So what is UI testing? So UI testing definitely is just testing your user's interaction, right? Which actually helps you like understand what exactly is it that your users are gonna be using, right? So you can define testing as a user interaction that helps ensure that users do not encounter unexpected results or have a poor experience in when interacting with your application. So in short, UI testing is just basically verifying that all the functionalities work as expected. So now, there are two different types of testing, which is we do have the automated and the manual, right? And if you're worked as an Android engineer or any type of engineer, you've definitely done both of them, I, I do believe. You've done the manual testing or at least touched on the automated a little bit. Now, let's look into the human testing, which is the manual testing. So wh what happens in manual testing is just a user taking a phone, doing the normal manual steps, right? You're, tap, you're verifying that, okay, this particular person ordered this, they picked this, they did this, it, it's work is expected. If you notice a bag, you send it back to the team and tell them, hey, look, this part is not working, this is how we need it to be fixed. However, the problem is, this is very hard to maintain and it's very time consuming and 
If you're an Android engineer, you know that we have so many phones that if you test it with a Samsung, it will not work on a Pixel. So this is something we've all experienced. And I feel like this is something I experienced too myself, where I worked, I worked on an Air Call feature and it worked so well on all the Pixels, but specifically on all the Samsung Tab A's, nothing was working. So unless you have like a source lab, a place where you, something is gonna work, tell you that this is not working, you'll think that, oh, my product is okay, so let's push it out there. So that's why manual testing sometimes can be a little bit hard to maintain, but I have seen companies that kind of like just do that based, because this is a, by, by itself requires a lot of resources, right, to maintain. Now, uh, let's talk about the UI automation now, because we've looked into what manual testing is, so what is the other part of it? Now, automated testing saves a lot of time and money. Now, manual repeating tests is costly and time consuming, as I've mentioned, right? So once created, automated tests can be run over and over, again, at no additional cost, and they're I mean, they're much faster if you think about it, right? Because this is something that you can actually schedule and once you've set it up, it will continue running and you can always just, the Q, your QA team actually, I don't think you have to bribe them as, as an Android engineer, you don't have to bribe them all the time, they'll do everything for you. And if you don't have a QA team, definitely having that process in your pipeline really helps a lot. Like ensure at least even if it's not 100, no, I mean 100% is pretty big, even if it's 70%, at least you feel secure that your app won't crash all the time when it's, when people are using. And we do know that an app that crashes a lot, it really brings a lot of strains to developers because there's a lot of pressure from the product team, from, from leadership, like, hey, our app is not performing as the way it should be. So that's why I think it's very important to make sure that we always lobby for, I'm gonna use the word lobby, <laughs> like bribing for testing. Now, let's talk about the pros. So I know that's a lot to consume, and I do give, cred I do give credits later on, on on my slides. But as you can see here, the pros are, for instance, automated software testing can increase the depth and the scope of tests to help improve software quality. And I've gone through a lot of bullet points here that I'm, I'm gonna share this slide later for anybody that wants to read into why it's important if, you, if you're also working in a team that doesn't do it, so that you can see if you can lobby I'm gonna use the name of Lobby again, the word Lobby again, in, to get in this into your system because I feel like it's good. And one of the things that we, I always wanna look for is the scope, right? So there is integration testing, unit tests, end to end. So what is unit tests, right? Or small tests? So these actually only verify a, a very small portion of the app, such as methods or class. Now, end to end tests or big tests, as you might call them, they verify larger parts of the app at the same time, such as old screen or, or, or a user flow. So you might see the advantages of that, where you have an end-to-end, -end where you're verifying a complete user flow. For instance, let's say your app is, um, is a login, right? And you wanna make sure that a particular user entered their username, their password, and then they clicked login, and all, like the exact step worked as expected. Now, medium tests are between uh, they're in between, right? Checks the integration between two or more, uni or more units. Now, the reason as to why I wanted to include this slide, the unit test suite, is because we cannot do tests if we don't clearly understand completely what exactly we're gonna be talking about. And I really do appreciate the previous talks that we had because they touched about similar things that help us as developers like build great apps. Now, first of all, there's the functional testing. That's the functionality, right? Because that's the ecosystem of the app. It has to function, right? Now, there's performance. We have to make sure that the performance does it quickly and it's efficient. Now, the most important one to me, usability. Usability is very important because here you wanna make sure that your app is usable. Another one that's very important to me is the visual design. What do I mean by visual design? Is to make sure that the way it's anticipated to work and the vis visuality of it is exactly as it should be. Now, not the least, 
but very important too is the accessibility. I did hear this mentioned before, but it's very important to make sure that our applications cater into accessibility, and also when we are writing tests, we have to make sure that that is tested too. And there are tools now, actually, if you're an Android engineer, you, you're able to go to the developers.google.android, you're able to see tr tricks and tips on how you can actually make sure that your application tests accessibility pretty well. So that is something I champion to a lot. Now, what are the types of errors or essential errors that, you know, the test cases that we look into? And the reason as to why I created my, my presentation this way is first, we wanna make sure that when you're writing tests, the tests that are, so the way I think about tests is there are components that you don't have to test. And I know there's a big debate out there that, let's say if your company integrates a sonar cloud or something that measures the code coverage, right? And you might see it complaining from time to time if you've worked, how many, actually let me just ask, how many of us in their companies have a tool that tracks the code coverage? Okay, one. There are two, three. okay, that's cool. How have you found it so far? Anybody wanna just mention, okay, go. So, um, for the code that, that basically is for libraries, the, the coverage tends to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, the more customization that goes into the, the libraries, um, we tend to maintain average 75 to 80% coverage. Nice. Yes. Exactly. And that's why I thought about it like it's very important to actually know exactly which parts you want to test in your app. And if your company, because I've worked in a company where our boss was very strict in the code coverage, but then you're like, okay, so this particular uh, library or particular thing we are using really wants us to be at 75, but we cannot test this particular part of code, but we've tested the most important parts. And then you can break down to the, to the particular team and tell them, okay, so we've verified, let's say for instance, our, our, like our user inter, our user action, right, end to end. So we've looked into that. And also you can verify that you've checked into the data errors or the field width, things that, these are things that are very important to catch. So that's the argument I always bring at, camp, at my work, because like he mentioned, it's very hard to make sure that the code coverage reporting machine meca mechanism works as expected. And I don't know if this is an issue of course, it's an issue on their side. I don't know how they will they can fix that because <laughs> it's it's a whole story by itself. So definitely understanding those particular test cases that you wanna go through through it's very important. Now, frameworks. I brought. I wanted us to talk about the framework that provides UI so that at least if you're looking into this, you can know at least what you can use if you've not used it. And this is, for instance, the Espresso Testing Framework, which is what we'll talk about. We have the Jetpack Compose Testing APIs. If you've used Jetpack Compose, I think to me, what I'm gonna say is I love Jetpack Compose. <laughs> I feel like I'm a champion right now. I've not written any talk on Jetpack Compose yet, but I love Jetpack Compose. There's the UI automate, and of course there's the RoboElectric. There's a lot of also debate on the, in the Android community on RoboElectric, but definitely I think the mostly used one, the most that we've all used is the Espresso. And Espresso also, also offers a pretty good cheat sheet for everybody to, to kind of like just go in there, look into it, and it's easy to write the test. Now, here we have instrumented tests versus, versus the local test, right? And I, brought, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I wanna make sure that we know what instru instrumented tests and local tests are. So instrumented tests run on Android devices, either physical or emulated. So you might have, so one thing that I encountered when I was writing tests and just making sure that I run it on my application was, it really does take a toll on my, 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 Samsung, my Samsung, I don't know if anybody has, experience this, or when you run this particular test on, um, even if it's automated, when you run it on 
on a particular, like a virtual device, it's pretty hard as compared to an emulated. So it's always, I, I, I always encourage, and I know I might be wrong on this one, just to go through the already provided like Source Lab or other, I think Samsung now offers like a complete store where people can actually run particular, they can, they can use emulators there for free, and I know Firebase 2 does that. So the app is built, it's installed alongside a test app that injects commands and reads its state, which is very important. Now, the local test executes on your development machine or server, or they are also called hot site tests. Now, so I'm gonna go through some of the Expresso sample test validation that I talked about before in terms of like the data errors, like, and because I would not done this talk before, I only gave it at the mobile summit, which happened last week. And one of the biggest question that I got was, for instance, how can we see the sample, you know, like if we've never written any test, how do the test look like? And I looked into making sure I kind of like helped different people see it in, in different ways because we, st we still have many companies that are still using XML. But first I wanted to just show a simple validation of how you can write a test like to, to verify a SAT progress bar is shown when it's loading. And one of the things I always take advantage of is making sure that the wording, I know if you went to a class of testing, they told you how the wording is very important, making sure that the wording like showcases what you're trying to do. So as you can see there, we have those Compose test rule, that's a complete, a complete rule that's created for testing and then you have the set content. And if you're checking the login content, now if you have created a, a class login content, you can say the stat is loading and then you say it's true. And as you can see, that looks like a very simple way to write a test. Now, another, uh, another one here, you're trying to show that that progress does not exist when the, state, when the loading state is false. So it's just a simple way you can, you can validate that. Now, an XML sample of a similar thing would be, oh, sorry, let me go slowly there. So as you can see there would be the on view, and then you try to get the login email, you perform, that you input the sample text, and then you go to the password, you input the password, and then on view, and then you perform the click. And then you can wait until the, you can wait until gone progress bar, and then you do the particular check, much as it's displayed. So asserting the progress bar is shown. Now, so one thing that I also want to mention, I like to mention is when you're, I know many of us still use Rx, I don't know if, I wanted to make sure that I catered for all the groups because I know before I joined my new company now, we use a lot of Rx, it's still very widely used. So I tried to make sure that I had one particular example of how you can do this in Rx because it's also very important. So I'm just, so what I'm trying to showcase here is just how you can verify some of the states we talked about before, which might be pretty, is pretty helpful when you're writing tests. And I know there are very, various ways of writing different test cases for each particular thing you're trying to write. So that's one, okay. Now, so I, here I talk about how the, you use it, so here is more continuation of the Rx, where you can await completion, a sub count of value emitted, your sub sequence and item expected, a sub timeout did or did not happen, and then you can set an accepted error was raised, mostly for Rx. Now, uh, this is very important, especially now for instrumentation and using the instrumentation registry, and all of this is espresso, just want, I just wanna mention that too. And, um, those are low, low level API, typically used by higher level test frameworks, and it is generally not recommended to, for direct use by most tests. But as you can see here, we always need to call the instrumentation registry and get that, and then you can use that particular screen if you wanna set up your particular testing. Now, let's see that. Uh, also, this is a setup, how you would get the rule so a rule by itself is a comp it's it's um it's differently defined for testing, and um, you will definitely need to pass that class that you you're definitely trying to do. And if you're trying to navigate to a particular screen, call it in in there, and then you can pass there. If you're using the navigation library, you can use the direction. Now, 
I, also, I, I think I mentioned this before, that is taking advantage of the long method names in Kotlin, like just make sure that it's pretty written straightforward. Like when user wants to exit, make sure they can exit without holding data. <laughs> so that is just me showing how you can write a complete clear name so that if somebody comes up and comes and uses your application later, they can understand what you were trying to do. Now, I also got this question a lot. That's why I added this slide. Like many people wanted to kind of like understand how you can test navigation. And as you can see here, I'm showing an example of how you can write a test to not like, like test login fragment, like navigate to home fragment, right? So as you can see, we use that launch fragment in health container that's provided for us, because that's not, I, I did not write that particular function, but it's provided for, for us by Google. And you can see there, you can either pass in a null and then the, the theme of the particular app. And then, as you can see, you can create an app controller and send an app controller property on the fragment. There you already asserted null, request, and then you call the require activity. And then you'll have that val nav controller, which is equals to the test nav host controller. That's the, if we've worked with it, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't go in very in depth, but if we've, you've used the navigator, you'll definitely see that. And then as you can see, then you navigate. That's where you assert the destination is equal to the right <coughs> destination where you wanted to navigate to. So I include that, that because many people ask me, how can I navigate to another screen? For instance, once, how can I verify that I can really navigate to another screen? Now, like I mentioned, you cannot talk about any test, especially UI tests, without any flakiness. And I did not go very much in depth, but I feel like this is a topic that people can read about a lot, and it really takes a lot of time. But as you can see here, we have, a for instance, you have an action, which is click a button, and then it really, especially when you're doing automation, it really, it can get very flaky, and then you can spend so much time also trying to, to make sure that you're, your tests are not flaky. So understanding how you can ensure that you don't have that, for instance, not using a thread sleep, like don't call that, might really be helpful. But it's something that is still understandable. I think, um, no, understandable is not the word. It's something that is still needs a lot of time to understand, because myself too, we experience that a lot too, like a lot of flakiness from time to time when you're like, hmm, uh, what happened to the emulator? Like, what, why is this test not parsing and it was just, it's passing on my local, you know? So that's a very big topic. So I think the most advantage that I always say is using weight or sleep leads to flaky or slow test. So just don't use that at all. That's my biggest advice there. And then I definitely lead people into the, into the more documentation if you encounter flakiness because I know that can be very discouraging because I have been discouraged by it a lot. <laughs> So I wanted to just mention that there. Now, let's talk about now the UI automator. And the UI automator is a UI testing framework suitable for cross-app functional UI testing across system and installed in, and installed app. Now, as you can see there, the UI automator lets you interact with visible elements on a device, regardless of which activity is in focus. Now, so it allows you to perform operations such as opening the settings menu or the app launcher in the test device, or you can test, you know, look up a UI component by using con convenient descriptors such as text is displayed in that component or its content description. So there's a lot of great advantages. And for me, one thing that I always look about is accessing the device state, for instance, right? So here, as you can see, you can change the device rotation, press a hardware key such as a volume up, press the back, home, or menu, take a screenshot or the current window, and it really helps save time and resources. I think to me, that's the most key word. Help save developer bandwidth so that you're not spending so much time on ensuring that you've maintained or ensure that your tests are working, but most of the things that you need to be verified that are already verified for you. And if you've not, so how many of, actually, it's a good question that I can ask. How many of us have used UI Automator? Okay, cool, cool. That's cool. Because I, I know this is something that mostly will be done by QA teams. Because QA teams spend time testing and definitely writing 
like instrument like instrumented and automated tests for the team because that's how it helps them too because they do a lot of testing but sometimes I feel like this is something that as developers too that I can also look into and try to also understand because it's a I feel like it's a, it's a team it's a team effort collaboration where you ensure that the app you're working on is stable because you also don't want to keep sending your application to the QA team and uh, it you want this release and you've been pressed by the product like hey we really need this release out and you're like I have to, ver I mean, the QA has to verify it or they have to approve it. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, okay, it's taking so much time. So very invited beforehand. I feel like it's a good pattern to have or to always practice so that when you send it, it's not very flaky. Well, I'm gonna use the name, the word flaky so that the QA team is like, oh, this is not working as expected or I don't mean we need to get them out of their job, definitely, but just as a developer, just ensuring that we are doing also a great job. Now, I've also included some code samples of how you can write your automated. For example, the following code shows how you can write test scripts that display the default app launcher in a device. So there we have the device equals the UI device. So this is a particular object that you can look into and get instance. And then as you can see, they use the Gantt instrumentation, something that we used to before, if you notice the pattern. Also, Espresso uses the instrumentation. Now, uh, you can bring up the default launcher by searching for a UI component that matches the content description for the launcher button. As you can see there, we have that val. Oh, I also forgot to ask if most of us here are using Kotlin. <laughs> Just want to be aware. Are we using Kotlin or Java? <laughs> How many of us are using Java? <laughs> Oh wow, okay, I do apologize for that because my whole code is in Kotlin. <laughs> it, it is a push definitely and I, it just came to my mind now that there are still apps there that are still using a lot of Java. But at work we are really encouraging, we're being encouraged to write more Kotlin in all the new, we do have a lot of legacy code actually in our application which is Java but we're encouraged to write more Kotlin. So I do apologize for that, that I forgot to add a sample of that. <laughs> Java code. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, all app buttons, dot, you, you, you perform a click on the button to load the launcher. Now, another example here, you can, um, so, your, our, so you, you, your automated test class should be written the same way as the JUnit for test class. And then actually you can learn more by creating a JUnit for classes and using the assertion and annotations such as create, unit test case class. And you can also add a run with Android J unit. And as you can see here, we have that particular cancellation button, and which is a UI object that does that. You see text cancel, and then you have the class, it's, which is a button, and then you can perform all that. And then simulate a user click on the OK button if, if found. So pretty similar to the way we write the other expresses but this is definitely all done in a, in a, in a, in a kind of like an automated way. Now, as a best practice, when specify a selector, you should use a resource ID. And um, if one is assigned to a UI element, instead of a text element or a content descriptor, not all elements have a text or exa for example, like an, like an icon in a toolbar, you know? So text selectors are brittle and can lead to test failures if there are minor changes to the UI. So they may also not scale across different languages. So your text selectors may not match as related to So it's always important to specify a selector when you're like using a resource ID. As you can see there, we have that particular UI selector and then you can have an Android widget and then just specify whatever you want. And then you can put the text and perform the action. Now, there's also more to this setup. Like once you, your test has obtained a UI object, you can call the methods in the UI object class to perform the user interaction that you want. And uh, you can do actions such as uh, click, drag to, set text, clear text field. You can swipe up, you can swipe left. Basically anything that you can write, you can easily achieve that to using the 
using the and I will actually show both of so I will actually have a pair of slides where I show the espresso and the UI automator and then just see what are the actually difference or what is it about for everybody that's confused or never use it. So the UI, the UI automated testing framework allows you to send an intent to launch activity without using the shell commands, like get contents to, to something that we can also link into. And then as you can see there, we can wait until the object has up, like the package, and then you call the timeout. Now, uh, when you want to verify your result, you can do something like that. Now, I know if you've, if you've opened your application, any Android application from scratch, you will always find an espresso test and you will always see the way it's written. Now, that is for instance, when you're using the UI automator. Oh, the lights are disappearing on me. <laughs> it went back, okay. I hope I didn't step on something. Okay, cool. Now, as you can see there, uh, here we're trying to test that 10 plus 6 equals, 10 plus 6 equals 16. As you can see, that's an, an example. I feel like this is the clearest one that I can give an example of, because I know the other one was a bunch of a lot of information, but definitely I was, the previous slides I was trying to show how you can utilize it to test the test cases that we need. But here you can see a simple way to verify your test. So here we have the device dot find object and you have a UI selector, the package name, you have to give it a package, and then the resource ID, which is 10, and then you do click. And then I, I, we do the same with the plus and then the six. And then as you can see there, we find the object and then we do the equals. So finally, we can verify that the results, UI object, and that result is equals to 16, so we accept that. I know it does look like a lot of work, as compared to the previous espresso. If you've looked into the espresso, it's just maybe one line of code. You don't have to do all the resource IDs and specifying. But I think the advantages of it is just, again, it saves a lot of time. It also saves money and saves developers bandwidth. However, writing it might take long. And you, know, you might be like, okay, do I have time for this? <laughs> but if you want also, and that's why I feel like um, this is just going to be my own opinion. I feel like definitely QA is, is a very needed like, um, um, specialty that's very important to have because they can really help us in writing most of this. But if you don't have that in your company too, just learning it and making sure that your app, sometimes you've saved that bandwidth, might be very helpful because I know not many companies can afford to have a QA team. Now, um, oh wait, I hope I've gone forward. Yes, oh, I'm moving forward now. Now, this is where you'll see now, you are automated versus the espresso. Now, I wanted to find a pretty good example and I found this great Stack Overflow post. Stack Overflow is, you know, I spoke to a developer, she's been doing developing for 20 years and I asked her, what did you, what did you all use back in the days? Now I feel like we're, we're so privileged to have Stack Overflow. And she said she, she actually can't remember what they used to do, but they struggled a lot, right, in C and for try. <laughs> so thank you, Stack Overflow. So here, as you can see, the UI automated is a powerful and has good external OS system integration. E.g., you can turn Wi-Fi on and off and access other settings during tests, but lack backward com compatibility. And it requires Jelly Bean or higher. But as you can see in Espresso here, it's a bit more lightweight compared to UI Automator and supports 2.0 Froyo and App. It also has a fluent API with powerful Hamcrest integration, making code more readable and extensible. It is newer than UI Automator. So as you can see, the, the two difference, definitely Espresso wouldn't be bad to write the tests into. So that's what I, I would say based on the two examples. Now, Let's talk about popular UI Android testing tool. So again, in my slide, Espresso is not my number one. And I don't know if most of us here have used Calabash, but I do know there are people that use Calabash. Any, you've used it? Oh, cool, yeah, Calabash is, and I, it's, it's also when I was researching this particular topic, I really was intrigued, intrigued to know that there are other that you can actually use, because I was like, wait, I only thought it was Espresso. So learning that there, there are more ways you can actually write some tests was pretty cool. And then there's Detox too. I don't know if anybody here has used Detox, but that's another one too. And then 
this monkey and app crawler. So all of these also are provided by Google too. You can jump into them and read them. So here roughly I just go through like popularly used espresso. So I talk about in my slides just how important they are, like what are the pros, and I think to me the most that stood out was espresso. So fast and reliable testing, it can test web components too, building test recorder, active service and team, it does testing in such a way that the component is isolated, so this makes it other. This makes other activities or components available to work on. Yes, you have a question. Flatter? Yeah. Yes, I mean, you're writing Android apps, right? That is very true too. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, I'm gonna add that to my slide. But you're right, it does count. And I think that's a very good point because we also do have multi-platform KMM, which is becoming a pretty big thing. So definitely looking forward to see what we will use there too. But currently, I'm not sure. Do we? Do you know if we have any that they use now? What? KMM, Kotlin multi-platform. Oh. Basically, it transfers to the, to the right libraries into every platform, and Google and Android Perfect. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. So, some disadvantages uh, of Espresso, it runs only on application at a time. Tests can only be for Android, and uh, test, test cases are only written in either Java or Kotlin and deep understanding is required, but we do have a cheat sheet, so not to discourage anybody. So Calibush there, I talk about also the Calibush, and Monkey, and uh, our app, I think app crawler. <laughs> so app, as you can see, app crawler tools, part of Jetpack, to automatically test your app with, without the need to write or maintain any code. So maybe it's something that we can all look into, because this was also pretty new to me when I looked into it, I was like, wow, we have an app crawler now. So maybe I can use that too. I've not used it myself at work. We use a lot of espresso. Now, now that we've talked about UI tests, which was a part, big part of my, my, my talk today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about unit tests because I think you cannot tie everything up if you don't touch a little bit on unit tests too because I feel like they're very important to have too. So, and here, basically I just wanted to talk with just some of the importance of unit tests and that's, Test small units of your code to validate their behavior, promote good design loose coupling, avoid fragile code bases, promote sustainable growth of the project, and um, some guidelines to strive. I know these guidelines might be a little bit controversial because I do know that there's a lot of uh, controversy on tests, especially in the Android community with the mocs and the fakes, but <laughs> so don't alter global state or reset it if you must to avoid flakiness in other tests, should not communicate with the external system, fake mock server, this is, a, a, that's why I said this was debatable. View models can be clear unit tests, I like view models, but I do know that other, we do have other patterns like MVI and MVP and MVC, and then MVVM. So, I've actually, it's funny, all my companies have worked with MVVM. It's interesting. I did talk with a developer earlier on. He's worked on MVI and I was like, wow, I've not touched any MVI yet. And some guidelines to type for again, just continuation, unit testing dot test private method, just public interfaces, code to an interface, not an implementation, more flexibility of test doubles versus post to mock. Unit tests should run fast so they can be run frequently ETC. And so I wanted to also mention some of the CI CD tools I use and mostly I've found a very good, we've actually as, as our team at work, we found a very good uh, CI CD. We use Bitrise, I don't know if most of us here know Bitrise. And I was like, wait, maybe I'm promoting Bitrise, but I like Bitrise. It's really proven to be pretty nice to use, especially for us at work. Uh, there's also Saco CI, there's GitHub Action, there's Travis, and there's more. There's actually more out there. So, 
and Jetkins. And Bitrans is just a continuous integration delivery CI/CD platform as service with the main focus on mobile app development. So that's the good thing you can, it has documentation on iOS, Android, React Native, Flutter, and so on. It's pretty good. I find the documentation pretty good. And then we have test reports. It allows you to view all your tests in a nice way. And finally, I wanted to say I have a continuation of that on my book. And I'm pretty excited about this book that I'm writing. And uh, our resources are here. And thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, any questions? I think due to time, I can take questions on the side. Well, I'm sure with the sliders, instead of, if anybody has questions, go ahead. Okay, okay, because I, I was like, wait. <laughs> I'm the next speaker, so I will allow it. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I was like, <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, sure. Uh, when the crazy UI designers decide to change everything, yeah. how do you keep yourself from writing tests over and over and over again? That's a very good question. <laughs> And that actually brings in the topic of test mocks and fakes, right? So I always wonder, do we mock or do we write fakes based on this particular issue? Because sometimes when you're writing tests and somebody comes in and we've written a new UI and then everything breaks, it's really heartbreaking and it really costs a lot because you have to go back in there and start writing new tests again. So one of the things that I want to say that I like to go with is mock when necessary and write fakes when needed. That's, oh, that's my philosophy. Mock when necessary and write fakes when needed because sometimes it really helps. And then one thing that I always say is that do not write so, like if you have one test, don't write, man, don't write many things in it. Like don't test so many things in it. Like if a test, if a test like for instance at test, and then you're testing, let's say, this navigates to here. Make it specifically for that. Don't write that, okay, so this does this, and then it does this, it clicks this button, and then it does this other thing. Because I think that's separating each and every test so that when you know you will be affecting this part, only one test will break and you can go fix it pretty quick. But also, that's also another tough question too, so I don't know, how do you approach that? <laughs> I, I don't, I, that's been the biggest struggle I've ever had with UI testing. So. Yes. So that's what I, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Another question? Go on. Yes. Yes. So that's a very good question, and I always debated myself too, right? Because I'm. A, and this is just based on my experience, and I might be very wrong, but if a function is very private, first of all, you will not be able to access it, right, when you write in tests, right, unless you annotate it, like with, let's say, advisable for testing. This is annotation, uh, Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, the annotation advisable for testing. But let's say you have so many, so many privates, right, so how many of those are you gonna keep writing? You will write so many of them like advisable for testing, advisable for testing. I'm not saying that's the reason as to why you shouldn't test your private functions, but if, it's, if a function is private, I always, and that's why I said I might be wrong on this one, I always view it as, uh, I wouldn't say safe, but not testable, because it cannot even be accessed outside unless you annotate it, it's, it's, like it's visible for testing. So the functionality that you're passing in that particular function, if you can, capture them outside a public one would be good, but it's also a tough to debate. So anybody has any takes on that? Because I, I do, at work, it's, it's a similar thing I brought up at work recently where we're like, okay, we have this particular private function. So should we make them public to test them? Or should we annotate them with ad visible for testing so that we can test them? Or can we test the functionalities outside or you know, so it's it's tough one.
Yeah, thank you so much. I got a bar.